Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, back to the last part of the Clay Research Conference. And our first speaker needs absolutely no introduction, of course, Manjul Bhargava, um, despite being my student, has proved some of the most amazing theorems in number theory, which I'm sure he'll tell you about. Um, he's, of course, winner of many prizes, including the Fields Medal. Uh, he's also an amazing teacher. Apparently, I learned today, he's not only taught a course on music and mathematics, but now teaches magic and mathematics. Which <laughs> it's always, at Princeton, this course is always the most popular course for undergraduates. And apparently, it's overscribed by a factor of 17 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't quite managed that with this room yet, but one day, went on. Well, thank you very much uh, to Andrew for that introduction. Uh, hope that doesn't raise the standards too high for what I have to do today. Um, <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure always to be back at the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, this is where it all started for me in some sense. Uh, I was a, after graduation, I was a Clay postdoc, and uh, it's had a tremendous influence on, on the way I could do mathematics, and so I'm very grateful to the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to uh, be a, a participant in one of the workshops that's uh, happening this week on number theory at the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, in particular, it's on elliptic curves and, and the bertz winner tendire conjecture. And so the bertz winner tendire conjecture is one of the most fundamental problems in number theory, uh, one of the reasons we're having uh, this recent developments workshop uh, on that conjecture. And it's really one of the most fundamental problems in mathematics. Uh, I'm a number theorist, so maybe I'm biased. Uh, but it is one of the, the really fundamental problems that mathematicians are trying to understand. And so what I want to do today is give an elementary description of what the uh, bertz winner tendire conjecture is, because it actually can be described in completely uh, elementary terms. And, and I want to explain why it's important in number theory. Uh, and then at the end, I'll say a little bit about what's uh, known about it. That won't take quite as long. <laughs> uh, in some sense, <laughs> a lot is known about it, but uh, when you, in a global sense, very little is known about it, and we'll see that. Uh, so the burst winner tendire conjecture is, of course, very important to the Clay Mathematics Institute. Uh, in 2000, the Clay Institute announced uh, seven problems, the Millennium Prize problems, uh, for which they offer one million dollars each. So these are seven of the most fundamental problems in mathematics, uh, which the Clay Institute uh, really helped make popular outside the mathematics community through these prize problems. Uh, and as a result, so many people outside the math community know uh, at least some of the fundamental problems that mathematicians think about. So this has been a great service for mathematics. Uh, the names of the problems. You've probably seen or heard about most of these, P versus NP, uh, the Riemann hypothesis, the Hodge conjecture, the Yang-Mills existence and mass gap problem, the Navier-Stokes problem, the Birch and Swinert and Dyer conjecture, and the Poincaré conjecture. These are the seven Millennium Prize problems. And of course, the Birch and Swinert and Dyer conjecture uh, is one of these. Uh, of these seven problems, only one of them uh, has been solved so far. It's the Poincaré conjecture. That was actually, so remember these problems were announced in the new millennium in 2000. Uh, at that time when they set aside $7 million for these problems, they thought, we all thought that the money would be safe for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> but the Poincaré conjecture was solved just two years later <laughs> uh, by Grigory Perelman, uh, who, but the money was safe in some sense because he famously turned down the prize. <laughs> but actually the Clay Mathematics Institute was uh, was very generous with their money. If, if Perelman didn't want it, they, they, they've used it now to start a series of lecture chairs under the name Poincaré uh, in Paris at the Institute Henri Poincaré in Paris. So uh, the money is going uh, for in the name of Poincaré, which is wonderful. Uh, so today I want to concentrate on just one of these problems. So a lot of these problems can actually be uh, explained in pretty elementary terms. 
And the Bertz, Minert, and Dyer conjecture is definitely one of those. It can really be described in elementary terms, uh, even though if you look it up in modern textbooks, it isn't. <laughs> 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 so, well, that's the reason for this lecture. That I want to try and bring back uh, the elementary formulation of this conjecture, because that's actually how it was originally made. And now it's been dressed up in some fancier language, uh, which I'll also tell you. Uh, but uh, first of all, it can really be explained in elementary terms. And so that's what I want to do today. So how does this problem arise? Well, what are number theorists, what is number theory? Number theory in large part is about finding solutions in the whole numbers uh, to equations. So since ancient times, number theorists have been interested in finding solutions to equations like x squared minus 2x plus 3, x squared plus y squared equals 100, y squared equals x cubed plus 2x plus 3. These are all very classical examples of, of equations that uh, if I go back centuries, in some cases millenniums, uh, of humans trying to understand their solutions in whole numbers, x squared plus y squared plus 2z squared equals 7. Do these equations have solutions in the whole numbers? And if they do, how do we find them? That's in large part uh, what number theorists try to do. More generally, number theorists are interested in finding rational number solutions to equations, rational numbers being ratios of whole numbers. Because if you can find all the rational number solutions, then you can find, in particular, the whole number solutions as a subset. Uh, but the rational numbers have additional structure that the whole numbers don't. For example, they form a field you can divide. So that's what number theorists like to do. They want to find whole number and rational number solutions to equations. Uh, the case of one variable equations over the rational numbers is well known. So if you have a one variable equation, uh, then it's, it's a, if it's a polynomial equation, it looks like something like, well, some degree n polynomial in x equals zero, and you want to know, does it have rational solutions? And so that we all learn how to do in school. First of all, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that such an equation has at most n roots in the complex numbers. But moreover, and this is something that's really learned in, in grade school in most cases, is that the rational solutions can be determined using what's called the rational root theorem, that all the rational roots are given by taking factors of the last coefficient, a n, and dividing by factors of the coefficient a0. And that's, those are all the possibilities of rational solutions, so you can just try them all, and whichever ones work, well, those are the, those are the rational solutions. So that's the rational root theorem. In practice today, actually, people don't, there are faster ways to do it than using the rational root theorem. You can actually numerically approximate the roots and then look for rational approximations, and that's the, actually the quickest way in general to find all the rational roots. But the rational root theorem at least gives you a finite algorithm to find all the rational roots. Right? You just try all the factors of an, divide by all the factors of a0, and try them all. So that's the case of, of one variable equations, and that we know how to solve, and it's fairly elementary. So it's two variable polynomial equations where it starts to get interesting. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> once we're at two variable polynomial equations, we already reached the unknown. <laughs> So things we don't know how to do. So <laughs> well, there's some cases of two variable polynomial equations that we do know how to solve in rational numbers. For example, those of degree one. So finding all rational solutions to a two variable equation of degree one over the rational numbers, well, that's pretty easy because such an equation can be written as y equals ax plus b, uh, where a and b are, say, rational numbers. And so it's easy to find all the rational solutions to this. You just substitute all possible rational values of x, and you solve for y, and okay, and we're done. <laughs> so every rational value of x gives a rational value of y, and we found all the rational solutions. Okay, so that's the case of, of, of linear polynomials. So the next natural case to consider is that of quadratic polynomials in two variables, right? So degree two polynomials. And it turns out, in the case of degree two, it's not that much harder to solve and find all the rational solutions. And so that's what I want to describe to you next. So it turns out that finding all rational solutions to two variable equations is also relatively easy and was understood uh, a long time ago as well. So, so just as an example, <coughs> suppose you want to find all the rational solutions to x squared plus y squared equals 1. Very, very classical uh, problem that was studied millennia ago and understood. So how do we find all rational points on the unit circle? That's, a, that's equivalent to this problem of solving x squared plus y squared equals 1 in 
uh, rational numbers, if you graph x squared plus y squared equals 1, that's the unit circle, and you want to find all points on that circle whose coordinates are rational. Right? So it's equivalent to drawing the circle and looking for all points on there whose coordinates are rational. And that'll give you all solutions, rational solutions to x squared plus y squared equals 1. All right, so rational point this is the term that number theorists like to use. It means a point on a curve, uh, uh, or a point in Euclidean space, each of whose coordinates is rational. Okay, so we're looking for rational points on the unit circle. Uh, there's some obvious rational points on the unit circle, just to get started. For example, minus 1, comma 0. Okay, that's a rational point on the unit circle, and therefore it gives a solution to x squared plus y squared equals 1. And the key observation, so how do we, that's, there's some easy ones that we can easily find. How do we find all of them? Well, the key observation is that if you have some other rational point on the unit circle, say x, comma, y, okay, say it has rational coordinates and is on the unit circle, then the slope, S, right, of the line connecting minus 1, comma, 0, so say here is minus 1, comma, 0, say this is x, y, if you take the line connecting them, its slope is clearly rational, right, because the rise and the run are both rational. So what's more surprising, and what's, the, what's really the key here, is that the converse is also true. That if you start with minus 1, comma, 0 here, and you make a line, any line of rational slope through it, and you look at that second point of intersection with the circle, then that will be a rational point. That's slightly less obvious, uh, and I'll explain that in a second. But it's clear that if you have a rational point, then the slope will be rational, but the converse is also true, that if you take a slope that's rational through minus 1, comma 0, take a line with rational slope, that the second point of intersection will, will give a rational point. And so that will be a description, then, of all rational points. You just have to take all slopes that are rational, all lines, with rational slope through minus 1, comma 0, you look at the second point of intersection, and that will give all rational points. And so therefore, all solutions to x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, so the question is, why is that converse true? Why, if you have a, uh, a rational sloped line through minus 1, comma 0, that second point of intersection will be rational? Okay, well, suppose we take a line of rational slope s, okay, through minus 1, comma 0. Then the equation of this line is y equals s times x plus 1, right? Because minus 1, comma 0 is clearly on this line, and it has slope s. Okay, so y equals s times x plus 1 is the line. We want to intersect it with x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, so we just substitute that value of y into x squared plus y squared equals 1 and solve. So if we substitute y equals s, so substitute the value of y equals s times x plus 1 into x squared plus y squared equals 1, and, well, you'll get a quadratic equation, right? Because if you substitute this value for y into here, it's clearly going to be quadratic in x, and we're going to end up solving a quadratic equation in x. And that's the quadratic equation you get if you substitute s, x plus 1 for y in here. And there's a quadratic equation. We can solve that quadratic equation, say, using the quadratic formula or factoring this. Uh, the immediate thing to note is that minus 1 is clearly a root of this polynomial. <laughs> Right, because we already know one point of intersection between these, uh, right, between the line and the circle. X equals minus 1 is definitely a root here. And so, what is the other root? You work out what the other root is, and it's minus s squared minus 1 over s squared plus 1. And then, once you know that value of x, you solve for y, and you find that y is 2s over s squared plus 1. And if s was rational, then clearly x and y are rational. And then that proves the... So therefore, this point p equals x comma y that we got from taking that second point of intersection with this rational sloped line through minus 1 comma 0 is, gives a rational point. Now, we didn't actually have to solve for that second rational value. We could have just observed that this was a quadratic equation in x with rational coefficients. It already had one rational root. Therefore, the other root also had to be rational because the sum of the roots, for example, is rational. Okay. Uh, but you can actually work out exactly what that second point is. Okay, so what that shows is that all the rational points on the unit circle are just get in one-to-one -one correspondence with these lines of rational slope through minus 1, comma, 0. Right? That's what we've proven. And so that's the main theorem about rational points on the unit circle. So what we've proven is that the rational points, x, comma, y, on the unit circle x squared plus y squared equals 1, are naturally in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements s uh, in the set of rational numbers, q, together with infinity. Because if you don't include infinity, then you won't get the, the point minus 1, comma, 0. Right? If you just take all the rational slopes from minus 1, comma, 0 and look at the second point of intersection, you won't get minus 1, comma, 0. But if you take the vertical line that goes through minus 1, comma, 0, then the other point of intersection 
is minus 1 comma 0, because that's a double point. Right? That's a, it intersects twice in that case when, it's, when the, uh, the line is vertical. So that's why you've got to include infinity. And so what that's saying is that the rational points on x squared plus y squared equals 1 are in one-to-one -one correspondence with rational numbers union infinity. And the correspondence is as follows. S goes to, so if you have a rational slope S going through minus 1 comma 0, uh, that maps to the point x comma y on the circle where x is minus s squared minus 1 over s squared plus 1 and 2s over s squared plus 1. And you can see that if you insert s equals infinity into, that, into those values of x and y, well, clearly when s goes to infinity here, you get minus 1. And when s goes to infinity here, you get 0. So there's the minus 1 comma 0 that you see when you plug in s equals infinity. Okay, and that's the, that's the correspondence. And we've explicitly determined all rational points on the unit circle. In other words, we've solved a quadratic equation in two variables with rat, and we found all the rational solutions. And there's nothing special about the circle, about x squared plus y squared, that polynomial. There's nothing special about it. This procedure could have worked on any conic, any degree two polynomial in two variables to find all the rational solutions. And yeah, so that exact procedure, right? Because if you take a line, it'll, it's going to intersect the conic in two points. So if you start with a rational point and take rational slopes through, through that line, it'll always intersect whatever conic you have in, a, in another point. And the same argument will show that that has to give a rational point, and conversely. So in fact, we've actually proven the fundamental theorem about rational points on conics. Conic is just a quadratic in two variables. So let f of x be a quadratic polynomial in x and y with rational coefficients then what we've proven is that the set of all rational points x, y on the conic, f of x, y equals 0, is either <coughs> empty. OK, so here's the thing. We, could try, we can try and solve a conic in the same way. But to get started, we had to start with a rational point. <laughs> if that rational point wasn't there, then we couldn't even start that procedure. So the first possibility is that there are no rational points on your conic. And that actually happens. For example, if you take x squared plus y squared equals 3, uh, that's a nice exercise to show that that doesn't have any rational points on it at all. But if it did, or if you have a conic in which does have a rational point, then you can do that same procedure where we take rational slope lines through your first point. And so the fundamental theorem is that the set of rational points x, y on the conic f of x, y is either empty, or they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with slopes, rational slopes, q, and of course you always have to include infinity. So in one-to-one -one rational one-to-one -one correspondence with slopes in Q union infinity. And in case two above, so in the case where you do have infinitely many rational points, one can actually explicitly find all rational points just as we did before. We start with a base rational point P on the conic. So if there are rational points, then you can start with one of them, call it P. And then you take all lines of rational slope through P, and then you compute that second point of intersection of each of these lines with the conic f of x equals f of xy equals 0. And that will produce all rational points on, on your conic. And so that's, that's, how to, that's how to solve a conic in general. Uh, there's one thing that's missing, which is how do you tell that there's a point there in the first place? <laughs> okay, once you have a point, then we know how to solve and find all rational points by taking these lines of rational slope through that one point. But how do we know there is that point to begin with? Uh, well, it's amazing that there's also an algorithm to decide whether it has a rational point. I won't get into exactly what that is. But the further amazing thing that we haven't proven is that there is an effective method to determine whether we're in case one or case two, whether there is a rational point or not. Uh, and this is the content of what's called the Hasse-Minkowski theorem. So the Hasse-Minkowski theorem basically says that if there's no congruence obstruction, no mod n obstruction to having a rational point, then there will be a rational point. Uh, that's what the Hasse-Minkowski theorem says. And there is an effective way to test whether mod n it has a solution or not uh, for every n. And in fact, if, there, uh, if the Hasse-Minkowski theorem tells you that there has to be a rational point, because there are mod n solutions for every n, it, it actually gives you an algorithm to find that rational point. And so that's it. So that's the whole story of, of, um, of two variable equations that are quadratic. We totally know how to solve those two in rational numbers. Uh, and this was also understood decades ago, perhaps even more. Uh, OK, so the next natural case to consider is uh, two variable equations, but degree 3. OK, we just did degree 1 and degree 2. So let's go to two variable equations of degree 3. And it turns out in this case, it may have 0, 
It may have some positive finite number of, or it may have infinitely many rational solutions. All three of those possibilities actually occur for cubic equations and two variables. Uh, remember in the, in the quadratic case, uh, only zero or infinitely many. Those were the only possibilities that occurred for the number of rational solutions. But here it's also pos possible to have a positive finite number of rational solutions. So all three of these possibilities can actually happen. Uh, and given that one degree one and degree two equations were solved so many years ago, it's kind of embarrassing that it's already an unsolved problem <laughs> to solve uh, degree three equations in two variables uh, in rational numbers. So it's already an unsolved problem to determine which of these three cases we're in. <laughs> we can't even tell whether they're, <laughs> given an equation, we can't tell whether there's zero solutions or one solution or infinitely many solutions. So the case of cubic equations in two variables is the first case where we don't know how to find all the rational solutions. And this is exactly where the Birch and Swinton Dyer conjecture comes in. So all the previous cases we know how to do explicitly. This is the, the first case where we really don't know what's going on. But the Birch and Swinton Dyer conjecture does tell us what's going on in that case. If the Birch and Swinton Dyer conjecture was true, then we would have a method to find all rational solutions to a cubic equation in two variables. And in particular, it allows us to determine whether there were finitely many or infinitely many solutions. That's something that the Birch Swinton Dyer conjecture allows us to do. So, so this really is the next frontier for number theorists. We understand up to degree two equations. And degree three equations is a huge mystery. The case of deg uh, degree three equations in two variables, that's the most fundamental next case. That's the next frontier. And that's what the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture addresses. OK, so what is, what is the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture? So it turns out that cubic equations in two variables are special, not just because they're the first case that we don't know how to do, but it's also the first case where suddenly, first and only case, uh, where there's suddenly a structure to the set of rational points on, on a cubic curve. Uh, this doesn't happen in any other degree when we're talking about two variable equations. Uh, in that the set of rational solutions is not just a set, but it has extra structure where you can add solutions and create new ones. And that only happens for these cubic equations in two variables. So I want to tell you, tell you about that. So let's assume we have a smooth cubic equation. Smooth just means that when you graph it, uh, it's smooth. Uh, it's continuous. So let's assume that we have a smooth cubic equation, f of xy equals 0. f of xy is some cubic polynomial in x and y. And suppose we have a rational solution, that base rational solution that we, we've been talking about in the quadratic case. Call it x0, comma y0. Then it's an elementary fact then that one can do a change of variable uh, uh, in x and y to make, the, uh, make that uh, equation look like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are some rational numbers. Okay. So if we had some uh, f of xy equals 0 cubic equation with rational coefficients with this rational solution p equals x0 comma y0, then there's this transformation you can do that sends p off to infinity. Uh, so that your equation can just be written y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And that's, a, that's an elementary argument. Uh, if you want to see that, there's a nice book by Silverman and Tate. Uh, that's an introduction to elliptic curves from a very elementary viewpoint. And it shows how you can, how can, you can affect such a transformation. Uh, and so it suffices to understand cubic equations. It really suffices to understand these equations, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. That's a cubic polynomial in x and y, uh, where a and b are these rational constants. Uh, for the equation to be smooth, it turns out that the discriminant of this cubic, uh, we all learned the discriminant of a quadratic. The discriminant of this cubic is minus 4a cubed minus 27b squared. And if, if the, this equation is supposed to, its graph is supposed to be continuous, then this discriminant of this polynomial minus 4a cubed minus 27b squared has to be non-zero. Okay? And then that basically describes all cubic equations that have a rational point. And so an equation of this type, uh, is called an elliptic curve in Weierstrass form. And it's very convenient to use this canonical form because there are very few coefficients around. It's a very, very simple form of a general cubic equation with a rational solution. And once we have the equation in this form, it's now very easy to describe uh, this extra special structure I was telling you that cubic equations possess. So uh, 
the rational solutions, as I said, they don't just form a set, but they form a set with this extra structure of addition. So the graph of an elliptic curve, in other words, a curve that looks like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, tends to look like one of the following two pictures. So it either has two components, like that. So there's this part which is called, often called the egg, and there's the infinite component. And sometimes you only get the infinite component. And what that depends on is just on whether this cubic here has three real roots, right? Because it has three points of intersection with the x-axis, or one real root, in which case it only has one point of intersection with the x-axis. And so these are the kinds of two kinds of pictures that you can get for an elliptic curve when you graph it over R2. And that, so you get these pictures in accordance with whether the cubic polynomial in X has one real root or three real roots. Okay, so that's what an equation of an elliptic curve looks like when you graph it in R2. And so once you've seen those pictures, then you can now sort of understand what this extra structure is. So here's the extra structure. It has a really beautiful description. So if one has two rational points, okay, so two rational solutions to that cubic equation, okay, on this elliptic curve, then the line connecting those two rational points, and this is exactly what we did in the conic case. We like to take lines through, we have to start with a rational point and we take lines through it. Uh, the reason that doesn't quite work in the cubic case to find all rational points is if you start with a base rational point and you take a line through it, Right? even if it has rational slope, uh, it doesn't just have one other point of intersection. It's a cubic equation. It's going to have two other points of intersection. And in general, those two other points won't be rational. Okay? Because why? Because you're solving a cubic equation that has rational coefficients. It has one rational root. That doesn't imply that the other two are rational. But if you start with two rational points and you take the line through them, that'll have rational slope. And now if you take If has two rational points on a cubic curve, then the line connecting those two rational points will be a third rational point. So given rational points P and Q on our elliptic curve E, our cubic curve E, we may define a rational point which we call P plus Q uh, as follows. So we start with a rational point, say P here and Q here. We can take the line through them, and that's going to intersect in a third point, and then we can reflect it across the x-axis. Remember, it's y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So if x comma y is a point, then x comma minus y is also a point. So you can always reflect across the x-axis and end up on a, on a point on the curve. And that we can call p plus q. And that's a method of taking two rational points and producing a third rational point. So if we start with two rational points, p and q, we can produce this third rational point called p plus q. And one checks that together with the point at infinity as the identity, so the point at infinity is the point you get when you follow this curve all the way up to infinity, which is the same one as you get when you follow this all the way down to infinity. So in, the, in other words, just in the projective plane, uh, there'll be one extra point at infinity, which you get by following this all the way up. If you let that be the identity, then one checks that, that this law of, of composition called plus, that takes P and Q and sends it to P plus Q, that turns this set of rational points on the elliptic curve into a group. Uh, so it gives you an addition structure uh, on the set of rational points. Given a P and a Q, you can always produce a third called P plus Q. And it has all sorts of great properties. Uh, for example, so one thing that's not clear from this definition uh, is that P plus Q plus R is the same as P plus Q plus R. <laughs> Those two things are the same. So the associative law is satisfied. That that's not immediately clear from this definition, but you can work it out using coordinates or uh, uh, there are highbrow ways of understanding it immediately uh, in the sense that this is what group we're getting here is called the divisor class group. Okay, so this gives a law of addition on the set of rational points on a cubic curve. And you can sort of see just from this description that there's no way to really get such a, such a special addition structure in any other degree, something very special to cubic. Where you take two points, you take the line through them, reflect across the x-axis, and that gives this amazing addition structure. And so mathematicians not only study the set of rational points, they study the group of rational points in the cubic case. And there's a lot known about this group. So given a rational elliptic curve, the group of rational points on E is called E of Q. That's the set of rational points, or the group of rational points uh, on E. And one thing we know about this group is that the group E of Q of rational points on E, it's an abelian group. I should have mentioned that. P plus Q is clearly Q plus P because right? the line connecting P and Q is the same as the line connecting Q and P. 
And what we know about this abelian group is that it's finitely generated. In other words, you only need finitely many rational points to generate all of them by just uh, playing this connect the dots procedure where you take two, two rational points and you connect them and reflect across the x-axis and keep doing that. So Mordell's theorem saying is that even though there may be infinitely many rational points on your cubic curve, you only ever need to start with some finite set of them so that by playing this connect the dots game, you can produce all of them. So since E of Q is finitely generated as an abelian group, we know by the fundamental theorem of abelian groups uh, that E of Q is just a product of cyclic groups, a finite number of cyclic groups. Some number of infinite cyclic groups, Z to the R, and then some, some torsion, uh, finite abelian group. So in other words, this group of rational points uh, looks like Z to the R times T, where T is this finite torsion abelian group. And it's a theorem of Mazur that this group T is actually quite restricted. It can only be at most 16 in size. It's a beautiful theorem of Mazur. So this thing is very small, this T part. And so what E of Q basically looks like, in general, is just a product of infinite cyclic groups, Z to the R. So it just looks like this R-dimensional lattice as a group. And so you can, you can imagine that this invariant R of E of Q is one of the most studied uh, invariance of an elliptic curve. That really tells you the structure of the group. And in particular, it tells you how big the group E of Q is. Right? So if R is zero, that's the case where E has finitely many rational points. Right? And when R is one or more, that's the case where it has infinitely many rational points. Uh, and in that case, R tells you how infinite <laughs> that set of rational points is. <laughs> right? So if R is bigger, then the, somehow E of Q is even more infinite than just regular infinite. <laughs> so the quantity R is called the rank of E, and it measures how big that set of rational points is. So in an element, just in elementary terms, the rank of E essentially measures the number of points needed to generate all the rational points on the curve. So the number of points that you have to start with to generate all points on the curve by the connect the dots game, right, where you take two points, you connect them, and reflect across the x-axis. Uh, you only need to start with finitely many. Mordell's theorem says that you only need to start with those finite number of those rational points, and then all the others can be generated just by uh, connecting dots and finding the third point of intersection. Okay, so that's a, that's a beautiful and fundamental theorem of Mordell, and it's what allows us to define this fundamental invariant called R, the rank. And so we're interested in what, what this rank can be and how it's distributed. Uh, can we determine the rank given an elliptic curve? These are all natural questions that you can now start asking, given an elliptic curve, uh, to understand its rational points. It's really all about this rank R uh, that tells us uh, how many rational points there are. So basically any question that you might ask about the rank, there are lots of them, <laughs> we don't know the answer to. <laughs> so the most basic question about rank that you might ask are probably unsolved. For example, what is the maximum that the rank of an elliptic curve can be? We don't know. Can it go all the way to infinity? We don't know that. <laughs> is there a maximum at all, or does it go off to infinity? We, we, uh, we don't know. Uh, the current record for the largest rank uh, is at least 28. We don't know that it's actually 28. <laughs> we just know that it's at least 28. <laughs> and that's the highest that's been found. Um, it was found by Noah Melkes in 2006. He found 28 independent points on this curve. You know, that, you know, and then there was 28 points that couldn't be obtained from the others by this connect the dots procedure. And so therefore, the rank is at least 28 but no one's proven that it's exactly 28 or whether it's even bigger. And that's the largest number of independent points that have, have ever been found on an elliptic curve. What is the expected size? That is the average size of the rank. So if you go across all elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and just vary a and b, and look at how the r's that you're getting are distributed, uh, well, we know very little about the distribution. In particular, do most curves have rank 0 or 1? That's a natural question to ask. Uh, and most mathematicians believe that 100% of elliptic curves should have rank 0 or 1, uh, whereas 0% should have rank 2 or higher. 0% doesn't mean 0, it just means 0% as a percent, <laughs> uh, as a density. <laughs> uh, it's expected that uh, curves with rank 2 or higher are going to be really, rare, really rare. But, of course, we don't know that. Uh, 
So we, we ask babier questions, like can one prove that even say 1% of all elliptic curves have rank 0 or rank 1? Uh, and that's something that was proven recently, and I'll describe later. And of course, the fundamental question, which is addressed by the Bert Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, is is there any algorithm, given an elliptic curve, just given a cubic equation in x and y, is there any algorithm to decide or to d determine the rank of an elliptic curve? <laughs> that will provably terminate <laughs> with the correct answer. <laughs> of course, you can always make an algorithm. <laughs> But is there an algorithm that takes in an elliptic curve and tells you the correct rank and that will provably actually terminate and tell you the correct rank? Um, we do not know any such algorithm. Uh, but it's this last question that the Bertson Swinnerton Dyer conjecture addresses. If the Bertson Swinnerton Dyer conjecture was true, then we would have an algorithm uh, to determine the rank of any given elliptic curve. And so that's, again, a reason why this Bertson Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. Is, is so important, is that it gives you a method of determining the rank, and in fact, it gives you a method of determining all the rational points, just like we were able to do in the quadratic case. We were able to determine all the rational points on the circle or on any conic. Burson Swinnerton Dyer conjecture would give you a method of determining all the rational points on, on an elliptic curve, on a cubic curve in x and y. Um, let's see. No, it's only the last one that it tells you. <laughs> And it gives you an algorithm to determine uh, the rational points. Yeah. Okay, so I've told you why, why the Bertson Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is important, but I haven't told you what the conjecture is. <laughs> so that's what I want to that's what I want to tell you next. So as is often the case in number theory, and as you I already mentioned in the case of the hassan minkowski theorem, uh, if you're looking at an equation, you can get a lot of information about whether the equation has solutions over the integers, over the whole numbers, uh, by looking at solutions mod p. Okay, so you can reduce the equation mod p and see, does it, have equation, does it have solutions mod p? So in, in the quadratic case, this is exactly how to decide whether a solution exists. So that's the haskin minkowski theorem, is that if your equation, your quadratic equation has solutions mod n for all n, then it has to have a solution. That's not true for cubic equations. So the haskin minkowski theorem is not true for cubic equations. But Bertson, Swinnerton, and Dyer thought, well, still looking at the equation mod p and gathering information should still tell us. There should be a way to still use that to decide whether there are solutions. And that's really their ingenious idea. Even though the haskin minkowski theorem doesn't hold over, over four cubic equations, uh, still, mod p information, they thought it should give us enough information uh, to tell us whether there are solutions. So in 1960, Burson, Swinnerton, Dyer did some really amazing computations of ranks of elliptic curves. So even though there isn't an algorithm in general, there are algorithms that tend to work most of the time. And so they used those algorithms to, to produce the ranks of, of lots of elliptic curves. And this is back in 1960 when they had a computer with 4K of memory. And <laughs> They wrote these brilliant programs uh, that, that just in 4K memory could compute ranks of many, many elliptic curves. And so they computed, they made this list of elliptic curves with their ranks, and then they tabulated the number of points modulo p, the number of solutions modulo p for lots of primes p. So as I said, they had to write this code in very clever ways, because their computers, as I said, had very limited memory. <laughs> So, okay, so what does it mean to take points mod p, right? You take your equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and you reduce it, you look at it mod p and look at just values in 0 through p minus 1, modulo p, and see if they, they, they give you solutions. Uh, so how many solutions do we expect mod p of the equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b? What's the expectation? Well, in general, if, right, if you take a random equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, then one expects that mod p it should have about p points. Okay, why is that? Well, you can take any mod p value for x, right? And you plug that in, and then you can try to solve for y. And when will you have a solution for y? Exactly when, uh, after you plugged in that value of x, you got a square mod p. Then there'll be a square root, right? And you can take the square root, and that'll be y. Uh, what percentage of the numbers in mod p are squares? About half of them. Right, half for squares and half for non-squares. Right, once p is at least 3. Mod p, half the numbers are squares and half the numbers are non-squares. So if you plug in some value of x mod p, there are p values that you can plug in, then half of them will be squares. But, so the probability 
is about a half. That you're, if you plug in a random value of x, you'll get a square. Uh, and if it is a square, then you're going to have two solutions for y, right? So there are p-values that you can plug in for x. About half of them will give you squares, but then for each of them, you'll be two values of y. So the total number of solutions will be about p, right? Okay, so y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, you expect about p solutions mod p. So in other words, so let np be the number of mod p solutions, and what we're saying is that one expects that np over p should be about 1, right? Most of the time, okay? Because the number of mod p solutions you expect to be about p, so that number np over p should be approximately equal to 1, most of the time. But here's the thing, if e has lots of rational points on it, then you can take those rational points and reduce the mod p. Remember, it makes sense to reduce a, even a rational number mod p, because mod p, remember, it forms a field. So even if they're denominators, you can still reduce the mod p as long as there are no p's in the denominators. Uh, and if there are p's in the, in the denominators, you just consider it the, as the point at infinity. So it makes sense to take rational points mod p. And if E has lots of rational solutions, then reducing mod p, you produce lots of mod p solutions. Right? So if E has lots of rational points on it, then reducing these points mod p would give lots of points on the elliptic curve mod p. And so somehow, you might expect that np over p might get a little bigger in that case. If there are lots of rational points, and you expect for a random elliptic curve np over p to be about size 1, but if there are lots of rational points, then maybe np over p will be nudged a little bit higher <laughs> uh, for lots of p, because all these rational points are reducing mod p to, to give you lots of points mod p. So this is the, this is the remarkable hypothesis of Burson, Spinach, and Dara. They hypothesize that if the rank of the elliptic curve e is large, then on average, one should notice E having more points mod P than one would expect uh, for many, uh, and that might happen for many P. So on average, one should notice E having more points, more than P points modulo P in that case. So in other words, one should notice that NP over P is kind of being a little bit larger than one uh, for a lot of P. And that's their fundamental hypothesis that led them to this, this remarkable conjecture. So their computations, they did computations to, to check NP over P for lots of P, for large rank elliptic curves and for small rank elliptic curves, and it led them to this, through their computations, to this amazing conjecture. So this is the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture. It says that if E is an elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and if r is its rank, and if np denotes the number of points on E mod p, so np is about p, uh, but not exactly, uh, then suppose you take np over p and just multiply all these np's over p's together for all p up to some large number x. Okay. So if the rank is small, then np over p, each one should be about 1, and probably this product will look like 1. It will grow like 1, even as x gets bigger and bigger. But if the rank is large, then maybe np over p will tend to be a little bit bigger than 1, and so if you multiply np over p over all p less than or equal to x and you get, let x go, get bigger and bigger, maybe it'll actually grow with x. And that's exactly what they found in their computations. And what they hypothesized is that if you take product of p less than or equal to x of np over p, it grows like a constant times log of x to the r. And so here's the dependence on the rank. This, this function will actually start to grow if the rank is more than 0. If the rank is 0, then basically product over np over p is behaving like a constant, like we would have thought. But if the rank is large, then it actually grows as a function of uh, x, and it grows faster and faster depending on r. So log x to the r. Okay, so this, this is tending to infinity as x goes to infinity, and it's tending faster to infinity when r is bigger. And that's the, that's the Birch and Swinerton and Dyer conjecture. It says that you really can notice np over p being larger <laughs> than it should be if the rank is large. So you can imagine that you can try to determine r without finding any rational points <laughs> by using this conjecture. You just compute np over p for p less than or equal to x, and you see, look at the graph and see how this is growing. <laughs> and if it's growing like log of x to the r, then that tells you uh, that the rank should be r. Uh, Burson, Swinert, and Dyer also gave an explicit expression for c, for this constant c, in terms of arithmetic invariance of e, another beautiful part of the conjecture. Uh, that's the strong form of the, of the Burson, Swinert, and Dyer conjecture. This is explicit formula for c. And that's called the strong form of the conjecture. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the Burton, Smirch, and Dyer conjecture. Uh, if you can prove this conjecture, you win a million dollars. 
And in case it helps, you only have to solve the weak version of the conjecture. <laughs> you, don't have to solve the, you don't have to do the strong form where you figure out C. <laughs> so in case that helps, I thought I should tell you that. Okay, so you only have to prove that this, this R is, is correct as it is. You don't have to prove the C part. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the Birch and Smirch and Dyer conjecture. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, the conjecture has sort of transformed over the years, in the 50 years that it's been in existence. And there's now a modern formulation, uh, which is as follows. Uh, so if E is an elliptic curve, again, let NP denote the number of points uh, on E, uh, modulo P. And let AP equal P plus 1 minus NP. So you expect about P plus 1 points. Uh, subtract NP, and that sort of tells you how far you are from the expectation. So AP is kind of how far you are from the expected number of points. And then we can, we define what's called the incomplete L function of E by taking the product over all P not dividing that discriminant I told you before. So take the product over all P not dividing 2 times the discriminant of 1 over 1 minus AP times P to the minus S plus P to the 1 minus 2S. Okay. So S here is the variable. Uh, so we're defining a function of, of this little s that's defined like this. It's kind of a generating function for the APs. You can sort of think it's, it takes that information of all the APs and puts it together in this one function of S. And you can sort of see when, when, S, is, when S is equal to 1, then what are we getting down here? Well, we're just getting 1 minus AP, right? And, and that's basically uh, this, uh, this difference between P and, and NP in here. So, so basically, we're getting the p's over np's uh, when at s equals 1. You can sort of see that going on. But you're getting p over np rather than np over p. Right, so when you plug in s equals 1, you can see that you're getting essentially p over np. Okay. So this is basically at s equals 1, this is behaving like products of p's over np's. And in fact, so when you define this product, this product converges in the complex plane, but it only converges for s bigger than 3 halves. In other words, real part of s bigger than 3 halves. So it converges in this right half plane in the complex numbers. Uh, not near s equals 1, where we're actually wanting to evaluate this to see that p over np happening. It doesn't even converge there. But a conjecture of Hasse states that L of e comma s, this L function, should have a holomorphic continuation, a complex analytic continuation to the whole complex plane. And if it does have that, that analytic continuation, then it makes sense to speak uh, of the value and, this, uh, and in particular the order of vanishing uh, of the function at s equals 1. So remember I said that uh, at s equals 1, you're basically getting a product of p's over np's. Uh, so if the rank is large, then p over np tends to be small. That's the Birch and Spinach and Dyer hypothesis, right? np over p was supposed to be big, p over np tends to be small. And so if the rank is large and you're taking lots of products of p over np's, uh, what Birch and Swinnert and Dyer hypothesize there is that that should cause, if there are lots of p over np's and the p over np's are small, then if you multiply them all together, that should give you a zero <laughs> at s equals one of this function. And if the rank is really large, it should give higher order zeros. In fact, they hypothesize that the order of the zero should be exactly <laughs> the rank <laughs> if you take the order of the zero at s equals one. So the reason this is happening is that the partial products of this function, right, up to x, are exactly the products of np over p or actually the reciprocals of np over p. And so that's why that causes the function to be very tiny near s equals 1. In fact, uh, the order of the 0 there should be the rank. And that's, that's the modern formulation of the Birch and Swinnerton and Dyer conjecture, that the rank of e is equal to the order of vanishing, the order of the 0 at s equals 1 of this L function at s. So that was a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> It, was, it had a really elementary formulation on the previous page, and yet you s we say it with all this uh, technical stuff. But modern number theorists really like this formulation because it puts it in a, in a broader context of L functions, which have really uh, uh, been extremely useful in number theory. Uh, so by putting it in this context of L functions, it now connects to the world of modular forms and of, of data functions and of many, many beautiful mathematical objects. Uh, but I should also mention that this modern formulation, even many number theorists don't know this. I didn't know this for a long time because uh, this is the way everyone writes the conjecture. The way this modern, fancy formulation that looks like it's putting so much more math into it is actually weaker than the original conjecture of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer. 
And so if it helps, you only have to prove this one to get a million dollars. One drawback of this modern formulation is that when it was first made, the elementary formulation makes total sense. We're asking product of NP over P to grow like log X to the R. This modern formulation, when it was made, didn't make any sense because the value at S equals 1 is not defined. It doesn't even converge there. Uh, so that was another drawback. And it's not only weaker, but it's not even well defined. This modern formulation, which we number theorists tend to love more. <laughs> uh, but this amazing work of Andrew Wiles uh, in the process of proving Fermat's last theorem, uh, Wiles proved uh, that the function was actually well defined at s equals 1. This L function is well defined. So it's called the modularity theorem. And, and a consequence of the modularity theorem is that for any elliptic curve E, the L function L E of s does have this complex analytic continuation to the entire plane. And so in particular, the function is well defined at s equals 1, and you can talk about its order of vanishing. So uh, this modularity theorem uh, of Wiles at least allowed the modern formulation to make sense. And that's, that's a big accomplishment. And so now we are in this world of L functions, and it does make sense, and that, uh, that's made number theorists very happy. So this is a consequence of the modularity theorem. But I should mention, of course, the elementary formulation made sense <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay. okay, so suppose we have an elliptic curve, and let R be its rank. Then by the above theorem of Wiles, uh, there exists an integer R prime such that if you look at the Taylor expansion of this L function at s equals 1, remember it's now well defined there. You can look at the Taylor expansion. The order of vanishing is just uh, uh, the first Taylor exponent that occurs. Right? So order of vanishing, if that's R prime, then the Taylor expansion looks like some constant times s minus 1. Right? We're expanding around s equals 1, uh, doing a Taylor expansion. So the Taylor expansion looks like a times s minus 1 to the R prime plus higher order terms. Okay. So Wiles' theorem tells you that you can, do a power, you can do a power series expansion around s equals 1. And that first exponent that occurs in the Taylor expansion, you can call that r prime. So this quantity r prime is called the analytic rank uh, of E. So why it's called the analytic rank? Well, it's defined in terms of this analytic function, L of E comma s. Whereas the usual rank is sometimes called the algebraic rank because it was defined purely in terms of algebra, in terms of solutions to equations. And then the conjecture of Bertz and Swinnerton Dyer is that the rank of E, the algebraic rank of E, is equal to the analytic rank of E, that R equals R prime. So th that's, what's, that's another really amazing thing about this conjecture. It connects, uh, connects this invariant R, which is defined purely in terms of algebra, right? set of solutions to an equation, what's the group structure, what's the rank of that group, T totally in terms of algebra, where this R prime is defined totally in terms of analysis. You define this complex analytic function, you analytically continue it to the whole plane, and then you look at the order of vanishing uh, at a point, totally, completely defined in terms of analysis. And you get these two invariants, one from algebra, one from analysis, and they're the same. Uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of the Birch and Smith entire conjecture. It brings together algebra and analysis in that way. So that's the, that's the modern formulation of the Birch and Smith entire conjecture, that Rank is equal to the analytic rank. OK, so what's known about the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture? As I said, this won't take as long as the rest. <laughs> One of the very first theorems uh, about the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture was proven by Coates and Wiles in 1977. Uh, so they looked at very special elliptic curves, uh, those that are said to have complex multiplication. But here are two examples. For example, they treated the elliptic curves y squared equals x cubed plus ax for any a. They also treated y squared equals x cubed plus b for any b. And what they showed is that e is an elliptic curve that looks like that, that special form. And if r prime is equal to 0, in other words, that analytic rank is equal to 0, that order of vanishing is equal to 0, then the BSD conjecture is true for e. In other words, the rank will also be 0 in that case. So they showed if the analytic rank is 0, then then the curve actually doesn't have any rational points other than the point at infinity. And that was an amazing step forward, which has really inspired a lot of the work uh, that we've been talking about this week um, in the workshop. So these are just two equations that I described. They actually describe a whole set of equations called uh, CM curves uh, of class number one, but I won't 
Uh, I won't describe those all. Uh, I think the next major breakthrough was in 1989, uh, uh, then culminating in 1989 with the work of Gross and Zagier and Kolivagen. So remember, this result here was a result about analytic rank zero and only for special elliptic curves. Uh, and this next step forward allowed analytic rank zero or one. If R prime is zero or one for an elliptic curve E, then the BSD conjecture is true for E. So if the analytic rank is zero or one, then the rank is correspondingly zero or one. Uh, and this is a consequence of the modularity theorem of Wiles together with the work of Gross, Zagier, and Kolivagen. So we basically know the conjecture now for analytic ranks 0 and 1. Uh, but we don't know them for ranks 0 and 1, and that's an important distinction. <laughs> the converse of this is not true, that if the rank is 0, 1, then the analytic rank, well, it's probably true, it's just not proven. <laughs> okay. So inspired by and taking further these ideas of coates Wiles and of gross agge kolivagen and as well as a number of works over the years by Cato and mazur Wiles and of course, Weil's modularity theorem, and many other works, too many to name. So this has really been building up, but uh, it's led to this theorem of Skinner and Urbain uh, and Zhang uh, in about uh, 2013. And it kind of gives a converse to the gross agge kolivagen theorem, but only in very specific situations. And those situations are sufficiently technical that I won't say what those situations are. <laughs> but what their theorem says is that if, if R is 0 or 1, for an elliptic curve E. And if E satisfies various technical hypotheses, <laughs> which, so if you click that blue, it'll, it'll make this page of hypotheses. <laughs> yeah. But that page is actually getting shorter all the time. And this week, actually, we've seen a lot of improvements uh, uh, to what's in the literature uh, in many of the talks that, uh, that are happening in this week. So I'll give you a sample of some of these technical conditions. For example, for some prime P gradient equal to 5, we need E to have P Selmer rank 0 or 1. Uh, we need good ordinary or multiplicative reduction at P. Some of these hypotheses were just removed this week, uh, and so on. So a bunch of, bunch of technical hypotheses. Then the BSD conjecture is true for E. In other words, then the analytic rank is 0 or 1. So actually, for most zero rank 0 or 1 curves now, we do know that the converse is true, that that implies analytic rank 0 or 1. So this was another major step forward. But you can see these things take, you know, these, these leaps take, take some years uh, to happen. It's a tough problem. <laughs> OK, what about this question about do most curves have rank 0 or 1? Because it's nice to know these theorems about rank 0 or 1. But what if all curves at rank 2 or more? <laughs> then these theorems are totally empty. <laughs> OK, so we'd like to know that these theorems actually apply to some elliptic curves. That would be nice to know. Uh, so how do we measure whether they, they apply to? elliptic curves, well, we can take all elliptic curves, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. We can assume a and b are integers by scaling x and y appropriately. And so we can just range over all these curves, eab. That's all elliptic curves. Let's range over them, and let's see what percent have rank 0 or 1. Okay. And if more than 0% do, then we can at least say that we know the theorem for some positive number, <laughs> positive proportion of curves. Because without this, we don't know whether those theorems actually apply to any elliptic curves. So. Let's order all these elliptic curves, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, by the height. Uh, in other words, the maximum of absolute values of the coefficients of this equation, a and b. So we define the height of e to just be the maximum of the absolute value of a cubed and b squared. Okay, so then the number of elliptic curves that have bounded height is finite. Right? Okay, so we're gonna uh, what we're doing now is we're going to take all elliptic curves and just order them by increasing uh, size of the coefficients, a and b. Okay, so that's called the height, the maximum of a cubed and b squared. And then we can just list all the elliptic curves e over q in order of increasing height, in other words, in order of increasing coefficients a and b. And then we can ask statistical questions uh, relating the rank, uh, relating to the rank and to the probability that BSD is true for these curves. And the question is, do most curves tend to have rank 0 or 1? Uh, do most curves tend to satisfy BSD? Do any curves satisfy BSD? Yes, these are questions to, to ask. So the first question is, do most curves have small rank? And one of the things that we've been discussing this week is that we now know that most elliptic curves have rank 0 or 1. So it seems probable that those theorems that we know about BSD do apply. So this is uh, joint work with Aril Schenker, uh, 
we finished in 2013. And what it says is that at least 83% of all elliptic curves, when you order them in this way <laughs> of increase in coefficients, have rank 0 or 1. <laughs> so most curves do have rank 0 or 1. Before this work, actually, we knew that at least 0% have rank 0 or 1. <laughs> so there's an improvement on that. At least 83% of all elliptic curves have rank 0 or 1. And in fact, our methods in particular show that those various technical conditions of Skinner and Ban Zhang uh, actually hold for lots of these elliptic curves. And, and so as a corollary, we're able to deduce that a positive proportion of elliptic curves do satisfy BSD, because a positive proportion satisfy the conditions where we can apply the theorem of Skinner and Ban Zhang, and they do have rank 0 and 1. So, so a positive proportion of elliptic curves satisfy BSD. And the question is, what proportion do all current results actually allow us to prove? Uh, I really like this question because, like, so we know 83% of all elliptic curves have rank 0, 1. A way to test how technical the technical conditions are is to see what, <laughs> what amount of these 83% of rank 0, 1 curves that we know are there satisfy all the technical conditions so that we can deduce analytic rank 0 or analytic rank 1. And the answer is that most of them do, we can show, do satisfy all the technical conditions. Uh, and so this, is, this theorem is joint with uh, Chris Skinner and Wei Zhang, and it says, that the Bertson Swinerton and Dyer conjecture is actually true for more than 66% of all elliptic curves. So most, most elliptic curves do satisfy BSD, and so that's, that's nice to know. And this, uh, this week, actually, the percentage has gone up a lot. <laughs> uh, but I didn't want to say a number because I, I don't know exactly what the, what the numbers are because it's all very new. Okay. But at least 66% is right, but it's probably going to go up uh, quite a lot uh, over the next few months. Uh, Okay, so BSD is more likely true than not true. That's good to know. Uh, what remains to be done, though? It looks like, okay, well, we've solved 66% of the problem. $660,000, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Clay Institute does not agree. <laughs> because in some sense, there's a lot remaining to be done. <laughs> Everything we've talked about so far uh, has been about curves of rank, oh, it says ink there, goodness. That should be an R. <laughs> Everything we've talked about so far has been about curves of rank 0, 1. Uh, and that is conjectured to be 100% of curves. Uh, as I said before, rank 2 and higher is expected to be 0% of curves. Uh, so in some sense, rank 0, 1 is 100% of the whole problem. <laughs> but in another sense, it's only two values of the rank, <laughs> right? Only rank 0 and 1. So depending on your perspective, we've done 0% of BSD or we've done 100% of BSD. It's not clear. Uh, so the technical conditions, so a lot remains to be done. What remains to be done? First of all, the technical conditions, even in the cases of rank 0 and 1, have to be removed. So these technical conditions in the theorem of Skinner, Ba, and Zhang that says rank 0, 1 implies analytic rank 0, 1 only holds still when those conditions are true. A lot have been removed this week, but it would be nice to have all of them <laughs> removed so that you really know rank 0, 1 implies analytic rank 0, 1. And that's, uh, that seems like a while away still. So once that's accomplished, that would likely mean that we understand BSD for 100% of elliptic curves, right? Uh, because we expect 100% of elliptic curves to have rank 0 or 1. But however, it's, it's the remaining 0% of curves having rank at least 2 <laughs> that has been causing mathematicians the greatest difficulty. <laughs> there, are no, there are really no results in rank 2 or higher uh, at the moment uh, in either direction. And while this 0% of curves is rare, they're rare, <laughs> uh, there are infinitely many elliptic curves. We do know there are infinitely many elliptic curves having rank at least 2. And for such curves, essentially nothing is known uh, regarding BSD. So the next real frontier after, after rank 0 and 1 is, is, is understood. It's, as I said, it's nearly understood, but not quite. But even once 0 and 1 are understood, there's really nothing, none of those techniques so far apply to rank 2 or higher. And so that's really uh, the next the next frontier in this, uh, in this BSD problem. And this is where the real, really the next big idea is needed, rank 2 or higher. Is there a single curve of rank, so at least two for which BSD is not? Yeah, so for individual curves, uh, no, no, they're no, 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 not, not, the not, not the fine point of BSD. No, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, no Shah is finite. Yeah, no Shah is finite. <laughs> yeah, Shah finite is not true. But uh, the, rank, the rank part of the conjecture, the rank part of the conjecture, which is the million dollar problem, <laughs> Uh, that, that is known for individual elliptic curves for in certain cases, because you can numerically compute the order of vanishing, and you, can, and you can often show that the curve has rank 2, and that allows you to show that the rank part of BSD, just the, the basic BSD, is, is true. 
Yeah, and nobody's ever, even for rank two, nobody's ever found a counterexample. <laughs> there have been lots of cases that have been verified, and it's been true. Uh, okay, so that's really where the next big idea, but as far as showing for an infinite family of elliptic curves, say, like we've done for rank zero and one, that has not been done for rank two or higher at all. Uh, okay, so I, finally I want to mention another thing that we've been talking a lot about this week is that there are many, often when you have a problem that you can't solve, you generalize it. <laughs> there are vast generalizations of the BSD conjecture, uh, really far-reaching conjectures. That's another reason why the BSD conjecture is important, is that it's not just going to help you solve cubic equations, which, I mean, it does that, but there are such, it inspires vast generalizations that imply so many things about rational points on, on higher dimensional varieties and about cycles on them and all sorts of uh, amazing things. So there are many beautiful extensions of the BSD conjecture, some of which we've been talking about this week in the workshops. Uh, and I'll just mention some of these. So there's the block Cato conjecture, which is, a, which is a vast generalization of the BSD conjecture for, say, higher dimensional varieties and motives. Um, there are piadic analogs of the BSD conjecture. So we've been talking about these complex analytic functions and what the rank has to do with the zeros of the complex analytic function, but you can talk about piadic analytic functions. There's a whole world of piadic functions, and there are analogs of the BSD conjecture for those piadic, uh, for those piadic analytic functions, uh, which have been very far-reaching. In fact, a lot of this work of Chris Skinner and Eric Urbain and Henri Darmont, uh, they've been uh, getting at the BSD conjecture over the complex numbers by going through the piadics. So the piadic analogs of the BSD conjecture have actually been useful even for the complex analytic version of the BSD conjecture. And so there's a piadic version of the gros formula due to Perrin Roux. Uh, there are piadic analogs of BSD due to Bertolini, Darmon, Prasenna, uh, and many others. There's just a sampling of, of some of the works that have been very influential. And then, of course, there are generalizations over number fields, uh, fields other than the rational numbers for, for the Bertz and Swinnert and Dyer conjecture. And the last lecture of, uh, of our conference this week, uh, our workshop, will be by Shou Wu Zhang, who's, gonna, who's giving a uh, an overview of the many generalizations of the gross Agie uh, theorem uh, over number fields and, and other variations. So, so there's a lot, as you can see, there's a lot known about the conjecture in some sense, but if you just look at it as uh, uh, in the context of the whole problem, we're, we're quite a ways away as well. So, but this is a very, very exciting area of number theory, and I hope I've given a sense of, of the excitement of this area. Uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. <laughs>